What if James had just kept the invisibility cloak instead of giving it to Dumbledore? Hey, brother! So, first of all, guys, thank you so much for just being patient with part three here. We've been traveling and recovering, and we just really wanted to make sure we put our, like, best creative foot forward for this story, and, you know, tur turns out there's, like, a, a lot to think about. You may have also noticed that I am, uh, not Ben, because on top of the rest of it, he has just also been sick this week, so he asked if I could fill in, which, of course, I was glad to do. But anyways, thank you guys so much for waiting for part three here, so let's just dive on in. Because, goodness, who knew that if James simply had kept the invisibility cloak on the night of Voldemort's attack, so much would have gone very differently. As usual, you'll have the most context for the story if you've seen parts one and two, but since, you know, it's been a couple of weeks, again, thanks for being patient, I'll just give you the high points real quick. The idea spawns from a sentiment expressed by Dumbledore to Harry in King's Cross. But the cloak I took out of vain curiosity, and so it could have never worked for me as it works for you. It's true, Ona. What he means by this is unclear, but given that we know the cloak already makes others invisible, we started wondering, what is the added power if you're the true owner? And we decided that if you were the true owner, it would make you unfindable. Meaning, if the Potters could have covered Harry inside of their home when Voldemort attacked, he couldn't have been detected, no matter how hard Voldemort looked. But either way, Lily still would have sacrificed herself in the name of protecting Harry. But it means Voldemort could not have attacked Harry as a baby, and would have had to have waited until Harry's first year in school to attack him, where he would attempt to do so with the diary. But as ever, Harry proves his true Gryffindorness and defeats the Basilisk and the Diary, and Dumbledore is able to learn that Voldemort is using Horcruxes an entire year earlier. But with no other obvious way to attack Harry, Voldemort now has to wait two more years until the Quidditch World Cup, where Harry will again be placed in a vulnerable position. At the World Cup, Barty Crouch Jr. would still be in the top box and still take Harry's wand. The Death Eaters would spread chaos like they usually do, but this time it's with a much more intended purpose. Harry is flushed into a clearing, but instead of finding Winky the house elf, he finds Voldemort. And unarmed, Harry can do nothing but accept his fate as Voldemort attacks, but Lily's protection kicks in way later and Voldemort assumes his non-corporeal mist-like form after everything just backfires right in his noseless face. This time, with the full force of his Death Eaters able to immediately go to work on returning Voldemort to his body, they seek to steal the Philosopher's Stone from the vault at Gringotts, and in combination with Harry's blood, restore Voldemort to his human form. At least that's their goal. How do they do it? Glad you asked. Well, entering year four, Harry is now the talk of the town after his supposed victory over Voldemort at the Quidditch World Cup, and therefore catches the attention of the Beau Baton champion, Fleur Delacour, at this year's Tri-Wizard Tournament, which Harry is otherwise not a participant in. Instead, he just gets the watch, Fleur asks him to go to the Yule Ball, he says yes, they have a blast, it's adorable. But the Death Eaters are using Karkaroff, who is on the inside, to learn the details of the second task, where Harry is now meant to be the person stolen for Floor to rescue. But the Death Eaters get to him first, where they drag him into the forest, where Voldemort is now waiting. This time, though, Harry is armed and evades death thanks to the power of the Twin Cores. By the way, I know after the last episode, some of you asked if Harry's wand would still have chosen him without the piece of, like, Voldemort's soul inside of him, and I personally think Yes, it still would have, and there's probably a very extensive answer to this question, but I'm going to leave it right there for now. Either way, thanks to Mad-Eye's eye, him and Dumbledore arrive on the scene, and Voldemort and the Death Eaters scatter. Which brings us to the present, where we can work to finalize our answer to the question, what if James had kept the invisibility cloak? Let's go. Okay, so following the chaos in the Forbidden Forest, there are some overall pretty massive implications within the Triwizard Tournament. Not the least of which is the fact that Karkaroff fled with the rest of the Death Eaters, leaving Durmstrang, and even more specifically, Crumb, without a headmaster. Pfft. 
but it doesn't matter that much because the tournament ended up playing like directly into Voldemort's plan and therefore it is considered too much of a risk to continue it. So the champion is crowned based on the results of the first and second task where Floor happened to absolutely crush it enough to take the crown. Yay, moral fiber. So Floor walks away 1,000 galleons richer. Huzzah! Although I guess that means the startup money for Weasley Wizard Weasels goes with her, so it's kind of a bummer. I like to think her and Harry are still keeping in touch, though, with letters, kind of like Hermione and Crumb were like, maybe it's gonna happen, I don't know. In the meantime, though, there is a considerable amount of strife between Dumbledore, who was present to witness the return of Voldemort, and the ministry that has been riding the wave of being the administration that led to the downfall of the Dark Lord less than a year ago at the Quidditch World Cup. Gotta say, pretty short-lived victory, and uh, you didn't really have anything to do with it, so... But it means the Ministry is not exactly jazzed to hear that their problems aren't actually over and there's actually a ton more work to do. Ugh. But don't you worry, they're not gonna just pretend Voldemort's not there. They have a much different plan this time. But don't worry, they're still gonna be a nuisance. Voldemort coming back though means Dumbledore has gone hard to work seeking out the remainder of the Horcruxes in the time following the events of the Forbidden Forest. And he continues this quest all throughout the remainder of the school year leading up to weeks before Harry is slated to return to Hogwarts for his fifth year. And it is then, just before Harry's return to school, that Dumbledore writes to him to let him know that he intends to personally take over Harry's Defense Against the Dark Arts training upon return to school. In like an extracurricular capacity, he'll still have to go to regular class. Now, normally, Dumbledore waits until after Harry has heard the prophecy to begin Harry's personal training, trying to, you know, postpone the end of Harry's childhood as long as possible. Which even in the main story, it's like, yeah, I'm I'm sure Harry was just loving that childhood with Quirrell and the Chamber of Secrets and the being hunted by a convicted felon and being abducted into a graveyard. Like, come on, Dumbledore, he's grown up, dude. But because Dumbledore's been hunting the Horcruxes earlier, he has found one earlier too, the Gaunt Family Ring, AKA the Resurrection Stone. And as usual, Dumbledore forgets himself and tries it on only to land himself with a one year lifespan as the curse slowly begins to kill him. Thus, he needs to teach Harry as much as he can and as fast as he can, but he can at least postpone telling Harry about the prophecy itself and just say he's training him because he's positive Voldemort will try and kill him again and he wants him to be prepared. <laughs> That said, we also know that Voldemort's usual move after the Priori and Cantatum failure is to seek the rest of the prophecy, and that Dumbledore usually guesses, or is else informed, that this is Voldemort's plan, and of course, he does not want Voldemort to get it. So, Dumbledore goes to the Minister of Magic. Yes, Barty Crouch Sr. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think it was going to be fudge? Well, it's not, because as we all know, Barty Crouch Sr. was on the fast track to become minister, if not for his son being found out as a Death Eater following the fall of the Dark Lord. But this time, the Dark Lord did not fall at the same time, and his son was never found out. So yeah, he would have just become the minister and not fudge. Dumbledore, of course, has to keep his cards close to the chest, but does at least tell Barty Crouch Sr. that Voldemort will likely try to break into the Department of Mysteries, so maybe you should place some like extra guards down there like just in case but crouch does not like that he is not being told what the prophecy is especially since it sounds a lot like it will help him defeat voldemort like it should be dumbledore's duty to tell him what it says right obviously dumbledore won't be doing that but it won't take long before barty realizes harry could also retrieve it because his name is on the prophecy and he will try to make this happen which dumbledore also does not want to allow. But seeing this behavior as borderline treasonous and eager to keep an eye on Dumbledore and Harry, Crouch installs a new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor at Hogwarts, Dolores Umbridge. It is super annoying that she's such an effective person at doing the things she's trying to do. Like, she's so terrible, but like, that said, Umbridge is in a somewhat different position this year, like political alignment wise, because normally she is pro-ministry and anti-Harry, meaning that she refuses to acknowledge that Voldemort is back. This time though, the fact that Voldemort is back is much more common knowledge, so while she's still extremely pro-ministry and maybe anti-Dumbledore, the ministry itself is anti-Voldemort, so perhaps she's a somewhat more effective teacher? <laughs> hate the very idea of it. 
In fact, I assume she just performs all the curses and stuff on the students and enjoys the power it gives her over them. Blech. And guys, now I'm gonna take a brief pause to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Actually, true story, I had to pause halfway through filming this video to go to therapy and then come back. So see if you can figure out uh, when when that was. Also, yes, I know I'm wearing a different shirt. That's because Ben writes the ads. And as I said earlier, Ben was sick, but now he's back. And spoilers, we don't always shoot the ads on the same day. This is how the sausage gets made. You're welcome. Here's the thing, though. Relationships in life aren't always easy. Like, my wife Beth and I are, in fact, high school sweethearts. But that doesn't mean we didn't have, like, a bunch of ups and downs between prom and our wedding wedding day. Some of which were literally solved by therapy. But there seems to be this like misconception sometimes about relationships that they have to be easy in order to be right. But what we learned coming up on nine years of marriage here is that the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great. But of course the question is, what does that work look like? Well, whether it's a significant other, a sibling, a parent, or just a friend, therapy can help you to focus on setting proper boundaries, improving communication, increasing your own self-awareness, and just so much more. Personally, I keep sessions scheduled out in advance and even just knowing I have a place to go makes me so much more mentally prepared when conflict does arise. Like sometimes if I'm really stressed on the weekend or something, like just knowing that I will have therapy to go to can help me calm down. I will have a place to talk about it. But seriously, if you've ever even just thought about starting therapy, just give BetterHelp a try and become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. I would recommend looking for one because it's great. Visit betterhelp.com slash super today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash super to get 10% off your first month. Link is in the description down below. In any case though, Dumbledore begins Harry's lessons at the start of the year and decides to hold them instead in the room of requirement because this go around, there will be a different element to their lessons. And before you ask, yes, we know that Dumbledore knows about the room because he uses it in Fantastic Beasts like 50 years years earlier, so boom. As for the lessons, usually they're just diving into the pensive, and they still will, but this time Dumbledore will also be teaching Harry more dueling techniques, so more room will be needed. And you might be wondering, like, wait, why does Dumbledore need to teach him to duel if he doesn't normally need to? And... Don't worry, I'll get to that later. In the meantime though, let's talk about Horcruxes because there are some interesting things to consider. First of all, because of Dumbledore's early head start, as we said earlier, he's already found and destroyed the ring and identified the cup and locket as likely targets. He would also still have a theory that there is something of Ravenclaw's but not know specifically that it's the diadem. And then as for Nagini, she wouldn't even be in play because normally she comes about while Voldemort is in hiding, but he wasn't really gone this time. And then we have Harry. Is he's still a horcrux because normally after Voldemort like blows himself up in Godric's Hollow, a piece of him latches onto Harry because he's the only living thing nearby. This time that all happened at the Quidditch World Cup, which is certainly more populated than Harry's childhood bedroom, but Harry I think would still be the closest person nearby and I don't really see why the outcome would be any different. So yes, Harry does still become a horcrux just much later in life. Which is important because it means that as Voldemort dwells on the Department of Mysteries, so will Harry, even if he doesn't know why. And now, usually Voldemort discovers the like self-same connection between him and Harry after Harry sees through Nagini's eyes to save Mr. Weasley, but again, Nagini is not in play this time, so Voldemort's not likely to discover this, or at least, at least not in the same way. Instead, Harry is just left to wonder endlessly about the door with without ever even having seen it this time. Like normally he sees it when he goes to trial before school, but that wouldn't have happened. So now he's just dreaming about this door. Even without ever having seen it, he can still put together what is behind it. A prophecy concerning himself, which he can piece together because of Umbridge. Has asked me to remind you Remember, her motivations are to serve the minister, and he, again, Barty Crouch Sr., wants Harry to go pick up that prophecy. That is his big goal. Umbridge, of course, encourages Harry to comply with these requests, which, of course, he denies on Dumbledore's orders, and, you know, just good common sense. Obviously, nothing the toad lady wants him to do can be good. Duh. But that doesn't mean she's not able to plant the seeds of curiosity in his brain. I mean, it's not unlike what Lucius tells him in the main story. All the answers are there. Bottom. In your hand. 
And it all adds up to just a truly difficult year for Harry, who was constantly dealing with Voldemort dwelling on the door, and he himself developing all of the same questions and wondering if all of the answers lie there as well. I mean, the temptation is high. And in case you're wondering, yes, Voldemort will still be trying to steal the prophecy, but he also does not want to go in there himself. And not only that, Barty Crouch Sr., despite having all these disagreements with Dumbledore, is still listening to Dumbledore's advice about guarding it. So yes, Voldemort is held at bay personally. But what's making things even harder for Harry is that in the meantime, Dumbledore is not telling Harry what the prophecy says, only that he will know eventually and that the ministry and the greater wizarding world will not benefit from having access to the information. And you know, just trust him, I'm Dumbledore after all. I just, I, I, I got it. So frustrating though, am I right? Like, you know what it says and you won't tell me? Like, jeez. But Harry can't complain too much because under Dumbledore's tutelage, he he is getting extremely good at dueling and learning some pretty cool magic, but no matter what he learns, Dumbledore maintains that often the simplest solution in a duel is the best, and thus much focus is put on disarming. Expelliarmus! <laughs> Of course, as great as these lessons are, they aren't as frequent as Harry would like because Dumbledore is prone to leaving the school for large swaths of time and while he's away, Umbridge starts to get up to her usual tricks. After Harry won't willingly comply, she of course turns to her other favorite form of persuasion pain via bloody quill and writing lines, but her message to Harry this year is different than I must not tell lies. Instead, she seeks to remind him that he is not special and he's endangering the world by not complying. And so she has him write, I serve the greater good. And it takes a while as usual for this message to actually start forming a permanent scar on Harry's hand and unwilling to give Umbridge the satisfaction that it's bothering him at all, he doesn't tell Dumbledore this is happening. But it does continue to happen because Harry continues to refuse her. Then when Christmas rolls around without the attack on Mr. Weasley, Harry just spends the holiday at the Weasleys as he is eager to be as far from Umbridge as possible. Wouldn't you know it, he gets a surprise visitor from none other than Barty Crouch Sr., the Minister of Magic himself, who has now decided to take matters into his own hands. But this goes similar to how Harry's meeting with Scrimgeour usually goes, and he tries a lot of the same tactics Umbridge tried early on, you know, promising Harry answers and protection and the knowledge that he's assisting wizarding kind in defeating Voldemort. It's a real morale booster, you know? Harry, however, is not sold. He can still feel the pricks on the back of his hand and is super over the ministry just at the moment and refuses telling him anything, telling him that he is Dumbledore's man through and through. I don't know about you guys, but I always really just love that scene when he tells Scrimgeour that. Crouch is disappointed, but not surprised, and decides that the only way he is going to get through to Harry is to drive some kind of wedge between him and Dumbledore. And so similar to Fudge, he turns to the press. Unlike Fudge, Crouch has access to a very specific reporter who is not presently trapped in beetle form inside of an unbreakable glass jar. Rita Skeeter. In the meantime, however, Harry returns to school where Dumbledore finishes teaching Harry what he knows about Voldemort's past and lets him know that he thinks he is close to locating another Horcrux and that Harry may accompany him if he does find it. Harry is of course elated to hear this and tells Dumbledore about his meeting with Crouch and tells him about the greater good message slowly appearing on his hand. Dumbledore is of course enraged that Harry has been harmed in this way, but proud of him for not breaking. And knows there isn't much he can do to get rid of Umbridge, but he can at least make sure that such punishments come to an end. Fueled by their desire to defeat Voldemort and refuse the Ministry, Harry and Dumbledore proceed to have their best dueling session yet, and Harry even manages to end it by landing a spectacular Expelliarmus on Dumbledore, who is just beaming with pride. Now, you may have noticed that Slughorn has not been present thus far for Harry to, you know, steal his memory and confirm that Voldemort was aiming at a seven-part soul, which is 
Yes, unfortunate for the sake of confirmation, but this is also the number Dumbledore is guessing anyway, which he happens to be right about, so I think we're okay on that front. Actually, we totally will be. Harry has other ways of confirming the numbers, but we'll get to that. But for the next couple weeks, things seem to be looking up for Harry. He's confident in his dueling, a horcrux is perhaps on the horizon, and his hand-based punishments have mercifully come to a stop, as promised. But then, at dinner one night, the evening post arrives while Harry is at dinner, and Hedwig has brought with her a copy of the Daily Prophet with an alarming headline. Albus Dumbledore and the so-called Greater Good. Yes, it turns out Rita has done her digging and turned up some truly not so lovely information about Dumbledore, all to do with his summer in Godric's Hollow and the infamous dark wizard Gellert Grindelwald. The article is basically the chapter from the main story in the fuller biography, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, and Harry is horror-struck as he reads the words on the page. The letter Dumbledore wrote to Grindelwald, and the back of his hand begins to prickle again. He immediately seeks out Dumbledore to confront him about the article and to get to the truth of the matter, but when he walks in his office, he is surprised. Ah, Harry, you're sooner than I expected. I see you got my message, Dumbledore says brightly. What? responds Harry, taken aback by his tone. What message? No, I'm here about this, he says, throwing the paper on his desk. The color fades from Dumbledore's face as he takes in the article. Well? demands Harry. Is it true? Harry, this article represents a summer from my life I am least proud of. I am sad to say it is true, and I promise you a full explanation, but just now I am afraid we have more concerning matters at hand. I have located another Horcrux. And suddenly all the anger in Harry's mind is joined by overwhelming excitement and curiosity. I know the timing's not ideal, and I assure you I will give you a full explanation of this article. But I plan to try and retrieve the Horcrux tonight, and would like to offer you the chance to accompany me. I can come with you. Harry says, somewhat stunned. I promised you that you could, just as I am promising you the truth when we return. Harry can't quite separate the betrayal he feels about the article from the act of trust being offered to him in the moment, but knows for sure he wants to get the Horcrux, and so he decides to go. And so they journey to the cave, where you kind of know what happens, except it's all happening a year earlier. They break the enchantment, sail across the Lake of Inferi, and arrive at the basin of the Drink of Despair. Dumbledore drinks the potion, suffering horrible agony as he does so, and Harry collects the false locket. One difference I will note this time around, though, is that when they're sailing back and the Inferi attack them, Harry is able to put all of that training to good use and summons a truly giant vortex of fire to drive them back. Then, once out of the cave, he apparates back to Hogsmeade and gets Dumbledore back to the hospital wing, where he looks truly dreadful. His dead hand lays at his side. He's coughing and barely breathing, and Madame Pomfrey looks like she thinks he isn't going to make it. And it is in that moment that Harry realizes how badly Voldemort needs to be stopped, the kind of damage he's capable of inflicting, and that if there is anything he can do to relieve other suffering, he must do it. And so he goes to Umbridge and tells her he's ready to help the Ministry. And of course she's surprised, but immediately leaps into action, sending an owl to Barty Crouch and taking him through her fireplace flu network to the Ministry. Harry is quickly escorted by Crouch and several orbs to the Department of Mysteries where suddenly the door from his dreams looms before him and as it does, a horrible pain screeches across the lightning scar on his chest. Harry staggers but continues on, convinced of the correctness of his decision to learn the prophecy. And then there he is, face to face with the glowing ball, his chest burns again as he reaches out for it and then grabs it. Crouch is ecstatic, truly believing this is the answer he's been looking for to defeat Voldemort, and he quickly suggests that they head to his office to examine the contents. Harry hesitates but thinks of Dumbledore damaged lying in bed and agrees, and so they make their way out of the Department of Mysteries, but as they do, they're confronted by a squad of Death Eaters. Dun dun dun! The Dark Lord felt your presence here, Potter. 
You have something there he greatly desires. Fights break out all over as the Death Eaters attack, attempting to retrieve the prophecy. Run! Crouch yells at Harry, protect the prophecy! Harry does so and manages to pull out his invisibility cloak, which he still has on him from the trip with Dumbledore. He hides beneath it and makes his way to an elevator, dodging spells as he goes, but manages to board one unnoticed. The doors open on the main level. Harry spies the fireplaces and makes to run for them, but Crucio! The spell hits Harry from beneath the cloak, and Harry falls to the ground in pain, stares up in horror at the face of Voldemort, the scar on his chest searing with pain, the prophecy dropped. I thought so, says Voldemort, staring down at him, lifting the prophecy to himself. I suspected you might be hiding, Potter, and cast my spell just to be sure the carriage was empty. I must thank you for retrieving this for me. I have wondered about its contents for years. Now. Let us see what the future has in store for Lord Voldemort. Though, I must say, I don't need this to tell you your future, Harry. You will die here tonight. I have brought another's wand with me. There will be no protection from the Twin Cores this time. Voldemort voice. <gasps> Voldemort lifts the orb at long last to hear the prophecy. Asio! Suddenly, the orb flies out of his hand and towards the fireplaces where Dumbledore staggers out. He's limping and wheezing, but catches the prophecy with surprising grace. Dumbledore, says Voldemort, hate dripping from every syllable. How good of you to join us. I'll kill you first, then deal with Potter. Harry watches in horror as the two begin dueling, and it's magic the lights of which he's never seen. Giant fiery snakes, huge golden statues, spells flying everywhere. The two appear nearly even, but Harry can tell Dumbledore isn't fully recovered from the drink of despair. He's slowly losing ground, and then trips. Asio! Voldemort yells, and the prophecy returns to him. And now, Crucio! No! Harry yells, and before the curse can land, he shouts, Protego! at Dumbledore. The curse slams into the invisible shield and shatters it with a deafening blow, but Dumbledore is safe. Fury in his eyes, Voldemort now turns on Harry. Perhaps you'd like another dose of pain. Voldemort raises his wand, but as he does so, Harry's wand raises itself to meet his, shooting an eruption of golden fire that dwarfs the inferno Harry cast earlier. The borrowed wand in Voldemort's hand is immediately consumed, his hand horribly burnt, his eyes blinded by the light. He lifts his other hand to shield his face, but in doing so, drops the prophecy which shatters on the ground. Anger erupts through Voldemort, which Harry feels in his scars, but wandless and without the prophecy, there is nothing to do but fly. Harry collapses in pain and Voldemort makes his escape. Back at school, Harry finds out what happened down below. Most of the Death Eaters were captured, but not before the Minister of Magic was murdered by his own son, Barty Crouch Jr. Dumbledore managed to get Harry back to school, but has been in a terrible state since returning. The potion in the cave, the curse on his hand, and the duel with Voldemort have brought him to death's door, and he's using his remaining time to tell Harry the truths that he promised him. He tells him the full contents of the prophecy, that he, Harry, is the chosen one that his wand likely produced those golden flames because it was supercharged whenever it's targeted at Voldemort, and that he must hunt down the Horcruxes and destroy the one they found if he has any hopes of killing Voldemort in the end. And as for his summer with Grindelwald, he asks Harry for forgiveness. It is one of his greatest regrets. He was tempted by power and rationalized it with the greater good. Harry thinks of his own actions the night before and blames himself for forcing Dumbledore to come to his rescue, but Dumbledore says it's his own fault for not being more forthcoming in the first place. He tells him that Harry's rationale was to truly save lives while his own was just to gain power and influence. But most of all, he tells Harry how truly remarkable he is and that he loves him, that he's proud of him, and then he passes. And that is the end of part three of what if James had just kept the invisibility cloak. Oh my gosh. You guys, 
I had an absolute blast piecing that one together and it's always amazing to me how many different like story elements managed to work their way back into the story just in like different orders thank you guys so much for watching this series this far like it, it, it really is a lot of fun I'm excited to see how it ends because it honestly it feels more like I'm discovering the story than it is that I'm like making it up or anything so just uh, thanks for watching if you want some more what if action from us I highly recommend you check out our what if Harry was in Slytherin series. It is an eight-parter. It goes year by year, and it is one of my favorite things that we've ever made here at Super Carlin Brothers. So if you're liking this one, I promise you'll like that one too. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in another Life Brothers.